Hello and uh, welcome to Making Music. I'm Jack Van Breen from Guitar Showcase and I'm today I'm very happy to have my dear friend Mr. Tony Arellano here to talk about what it takes to make music. <laughs> Thanks Jack, good yeah. to be here. Well great. Uh, Tony and I have been playing together music off and on for a few years. We started when we were about five. <laughs> <laughs> so that puts us about, what, ten years now, right? Yeah, something like that. <laughs> uh, and Tony's been a player in the area for quite a few years. We go back to the bodega days. Opening of. Yep. In fact, uh, Childhood's End was a staple there. That yeah, was a house band for the first uh, few years, before they had hard alcohol. Yeah. Steak and lobster, beer and wine. That was good lobster. That was real good. Because <laughs> they didn't pay us enough <laughs> otherwise. Uh, and then you played with a few other bands there. What were some other bands in that era? Went from childhood's end and, uh, well, then we went on the road with the Buns. Oh, I forgot that. About was our that. Uh, Mountain State tours uh, for about a year. And that uh, kind of evolved into the Great Wizard Band. And then uh, from that era of people, I ended up playing with Sky Creek and uh, that evolved into the Fun Kings, which was another a band that played primarily places like Mountain Charlie's and uh, Pioneer Saloon up in Woodside. I remember it. Yep. Little tiny room. Few, small. <laughs> small. But uh, let's see, then we also had, uh, was when uh, Sky Creek went to uh, a band called the Trouble Boys, which in that case they didn't have any keyboards anymore, so I was, That's true. I was out of a job. <laughs> But it happens uh, a lot as a keyboard player. Yeah. Nobody right. wants to carry that big organ. No, nobody. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> they love you when you show up, they hate you at the end of the night. <laughs> but uh, yeah, and so the other bands probably were, let's see, who else? We, we played together in Shantae, that became Mr. Ah, Hyde. I, and, uh, I got a wife out of that kid. That's right, you did. And some wonderful daughters also as yes. well. Yeah, a lot, of, a lot of freelancing stuff, you know, playing with just, you know, hired gun a lot of times and yeah but it's been fun play with many people and you know it's been a great great place to, to play music for sure yeah I know we recently did a show about San Jose rocks the historic museum because right. San Jose has been a birthplace of a lot of great music absolutely I absolutely. know you hang out with one of the, the better known bands yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah that San Jose's had you know kind of like unsung hero I mean San Francisco got a lot of the headlines I think but so many so many musicians and so much music was made down here that I think carried over up into there, you know, yeah. and uh, it's kind of nice to see them getting their due. You yeah. Know? I mean, it's long, been long deserved and well worth waiting for. But as, as time went by, I know you uh, went to Nashville for a while. Tell me what led up to that and what happened when you got there. I was playing at the time in a band uh, called Fun Effects, which we had gone to the tuxedo route, yeah. which paid rather well, and it was a lot of fun. Uh, but some old friends of mine that I met when we were on the road in Utah in the early days were in Nashville at that point and came through and they were actually playing with Chris Ledoux. Ah. God bless his soul. Uh, but uh, they were the ones that told me, uh, and you know, country music has put a certain amount of, you know, food on the table for me over the years. So I figured, you know, talking to KW said, no, you, you need to come out here and give it a shot. So I did. I just kind of went, okay. And I packed up and took off for Nashville and was there five and a half years. and and had some great experiences, got out there, and uh, one of the first things I did was put my card up on the uh, board down at the uh, uh, Musicians um, Union yeah. in, the, in the lobby there, and immediately scored a gig out of that with Tom Grant and the Survivors, which I played through probably the entire time I was there. Tom yeah. had been on Ralph Emery's show for 18 years. He and Lori Morgan were the featured singers, and the hard part about that gig was sometimes we'd have to get up in the morning and play the morning show at six o'clock in the morning. And <laughs> a lot of my friends would turn it on just to see us prink, you know, have a clunker here because you're still wiping the sleep out of your eyes. But, uh, you know, through that, I, you know, basically Nashville, Nashville's a real networking town. Uh, there's a ton of just super great musicians there and good people. And oftentimes just by who you meet and everything, you'll go out to do a show and you might know one guy. Yeah. And you might not know some of the songs, so it's all about, well, what key and see you at the end. And, you know, th that kind of proves your worth and your value. If, like we say, if you have big ears, you know, it helps a lot. R learning to read the Nashville numbers chart was also very helpful to where you could actually sit down and just kind of score yourself, you know, just by listening to a record. And that helped get, get jobs as well. And basically, I think that led to certain doors opening up. This is where I met Sarah Evans and played with her right around the time of her first album. And just by who you, the who you know factor sometimes leads to, you know, led me to an audition with Toby Keith. 
and uh, which it, I didn't get, unfortunately, but that's <laughs> the way that goes. At least I got the, the opportunity. So, yeah, Nashville was very exciting in learning about that uh, and how those players work. And, geez, there's just a ton of talent there. It's, it's, it's unreal, but a really good experience. I'll, I won't trade it for anything. I was really glad I went. Yeah. Well, I know uh, Sarah's traded on that. My daughter's asked you about some contacts back there, and she's been back a couple of times, but she hasn't picked up yet. So right. we'll see what happens with well, that. She's, I hope so. She's got some talent. Yeah. So after that, you came back here and... Came, came back here and uh, was went back to work at my day job that I pretty much allowed me to play music all those years, which was in healthcare, working in dialysis, and landed me back in Santa Cruz. And... Uh, you know, after a while there, it just all of a sudden, you know, dialysis, nobody ever gets any better. So it's yeah. the redundancy of it. I have finally just kind of burned out on healthcare. I've been doing it for 30 years. And I sort of woke up one day and I said, you know, I remember for years and years and years reading Rolling Stone magazine and the second, seems like the second to last page always <laughs> had this advertisement for uh, full sale. Yeah. Recording, real world education, they called it. And it's a, it was primarily a recording school in the beginning 28 years ago in Florida. And I thought, you know, that's probably what I'd like to do is just, well, you know, Jack, as, as we've played over the years, we've had to play with the sound boards and tweak this and tweak that. And I said, I, I really ought to try to learn the technical side as much as yeah. I could. And I told my parents, I said, you know, 35 years later, I finally found a college I'd like to attend. <laughs> and they said, well, okay. So then once again, I'll have packed everything up and uh, moved to Florida and enrolled in school. And that was a great experience. Yeah. It was a very, very good experience. So. Yeah, so you initially enrolled in the recording... Uh, recording arts program. Yeah. yeah. They have... The school has a recording arts program, and it has a film and computer animation and digital media, entertainment, business, and law, and show production and touring. And I started in recording arts thinking, well, the older I get, I just... I don't need to travel. I just sit down somewhere, and they come to me, and I'll record. And yeah. That's fun. And then it's all very computerized now. So, you know... At our age, we were a little bit late. You know, the kids these days are right in on top of it, and they're just amazing with what they do. But the other thing, the realization I came to was that out of my playing career, I would say, you know, 80% of it was on stage live, and 20% was in the studio. And it seemed to me, with what they were actually teaching us at school about, you know, if what everybody can do at home now, the quality of recording they can get, studios, you know, unless it's a signed artist, is not, they're not being used as much. So I thought, well, maybe opportunity would be better served if I go and do show production and touring. And that was just the smartest move I made. Yeah. I mean, I, I lost a couple of months in there doing the, the trade, but it was, uh, you know, I was at home when I got there. It just made total sense. And, you know, because of that, I, I learned huge mixing consoles and live sound reinforcement and lighting as well and video production as well. And, uh, you know, and it's just like I was a kid in the candy store. It was, yeah. You know, a lot of good stuff there. So, yeah, I'm glad I made that move. And I ended up graduating with a, a degree. Excellent, excellent. And I, I, you know, one of the things that I found interesting when we talked about it was that your graduation exercise, as it were, was a production of a full concert. Yeah, the uh, final, final test, as, <laughs> as, it, as were. it were. Yeah, yeah. Uh, one of the things that really impressed me about that, and uh, I think we'll go over maybe to this camera, is our viewers should find this interesting this is a production handbook for a show, and it looks to be a textbook for a whole year, and in a sense, it is. It's the mm -hmm. final test. Exactly. But there's everything in here uh, for a show, and it, it's going to be difficult for you to see, but here's a... Uh, That's a list of the touring crew. This is the crew that it takes to put on a show of the magnitude that you see when you go to Shoreline or HP Pavilion. We've got lighting, camera, front of house, back of house, catering, <laughs> they're all in there. Everybody. Yeah. Um, I'll we'll just skip through here because it's... Yeah, we need a magnifying glass. Magnifying glass. A, a, a plot of the venue so you can plan where you're going to put the people, the catering, uh, dressing rooms, where the artists go to unwind away from their managers. Mm -hmm. A lot of interesting stuff in here. Um, plot plans for signal flow. Uh, we've uh, done a few shows down here where, where does the headsets go? Hey, who's got the microphones? Uh, exactly. And this is all documented in here. Uh, people watching the show may want to talk to Tony at some time about what he learned there, maybe even talk to the full sale people, because I've been to a few shows even at venues like Shoreline where the guys hadn't done their homework. Yeah. 
Um, but so you did the show. Mm -hmm. Part of the production was some video. Um, I believe we've got queued up some interesting things from that. If we could uh, go to the in opening <laughs> intro. So that was the production opener that the school used at every show? Every show, define your future. And when you would, uh, that would start our show, you'd be rolling that. And then once that was done, whatever, however the show was uh, put together would start. Sometimes it was one, two, three, four, and they just come in. And other times it would be, you know, something might be scripted beforehand yeah, or whatnot. Yeah. And you ran several video screens. That was part of the coursework, was learning how to tie that all together? Yeah, on our particular final lab show, we had, uh, we had projection uh, in the back of the upstage side, behind the drummer, and uh, four plasmas in the house, and a projection screen in the green room for the, the artist. And uh, that was all tied into, you know, obviously you have a front of house mix, and you have a monitor mix, and then you have a broadcast mix. The guy's in there on a 48 channel board for the uh, audio signal for video. And then we have another guy in a remote room doing a simulcast for the artist. When they come to school and do these shows, they leave that night with a CD of their performance. They always played a 50-minute set, uh, except for these final, this final show where we would have you know, as many as you. Some groups had three, uh, three acts. We settled for two. And um, you know, they walk out of there with uh, some media when they're done. That's the trade-off for helping yeah. us out. And they get the free exposure and a good place to practice with pro gear. And a live audience. And a live audience. We actually have a couple of clips of that. If we could roll the uh, second clip, which you talked about kicking off the show. I, mm -hmm. I particularly like this one. <laughs> Good evening, and then, uh, Welcome to Full Sail Axiom Productions. This is our last big show. And uh, accordingly, one of the things I have to do to document this is I want everyone to smile. Thank you very much. Hope you're here for a real good time tonight. We want to start things off with uh, one of our instructors and his wife who are fantastic. Please make welcome to the stage, Logan and Yvonne. Yeah, there's the Tony I know. Yeah. <laughs> nice shirt, too. Thanks. It's the only one I own. <laughs> well, you're a musician. You can't afford much for wardrobe. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so you talked about you had these multi-channel boards. How many channels were in the front of the house? Front of the house, we had, well, we had two. We were using a Soundcraft uh, that originally had 56 channels. And that seemed, uh, the power supply blew like about a week before our show. So we <laughs> ended up with uh, a Midas Heritage 1000, which is a 48-channel board, which was more than sufficient. Yeah. Then we had a Midas uh, Heritage 3000 on monitors. And an old Midas, geez, I can't even, I want to say Sienna, I think it was, in the broadcast room. And then in the simulcast, we were using a Yamaha uh, digital DM2000. So that's, and they have, you know, the interesting thing about it was, that's all the big gear in the rooms and stuff. But they have labs there where you walk in, and you have six positions, uh, seven counting instructors. And at each position, you'll have a 32-channel Midas mixing board with all your outboard processing gear and your video screens to where they're actually called mix labs. And you go in there and you mix every different shows, not just your own, but other people's. And it gives you the hands-on experience of, of mixing. And then the teacher compares them at, his, at their board. They can compare everything. And it, the class, they usually would vote on whose mix they like the best. Yeah. So on this show, I know that uh, we're going to look at a little bit of video for that mm -hmm. in just a minute. But you, how many tracks of audio did you capture 
You know, you did a CD live for a stereo mix mm -hmm. in the simulcast, but how many tracks were they capturing? We out? were actually using, it's in the book, and I, you know, my memory being what it is, I'm going to say, well, obviously with Yvonne and Logan, uh, we were only taking uh, two. Right. You know, plus we also used two house ambient mics. Right. Just to give us sound from the room. So four for their, for their set. And for the band, it was three guitars and bass, four and three vocals, seven, and the drums, I think, were mic'd up eight. So in the ambient. So you're close to 20, you know, on, on, their, on their particular. Well, plus we were using a Digicart 360 for canned applause to make the room <laughs> sound like it was bigger than it was. That was our, our front of house engineer's idea. He, he loved that little toy, so yeah. we used that. But, uh, so you're basically talking about 20 channels total. Yeah. Well, I was very impressed with the quality. Uh, we're going to go to a clip of Logan and Yvonne now, uh, and I would like our viewers to notice not just the, the song, which is interesting and is one of theirs, but yeah that there is ambient sound. This is a remix of the four channels that you initially captured. Mm -hmm. Also, you can see a little bit of, of the lighting changing and uh, the big screen in the back, which is why I picked this clip, oh, because good. you get a, a feel for uh, the immense uh, production that goes into even with just a duo performing. Mm -hmm. So if we could roll that now, that'd be kind of interesting, I hope. This is another original. It was originally called Song of Us. I'll just change it to Serenity Isle. Sun rises from the east and shines a light on me. Like a breeze come flowing through the trees Lift us up and carry us to a place far away Drop us off at the edge of the rainbow Picking up the pieces of the time now slipped away Lost but not forgotten songs within our hearts Forever stay I still remember the first time I laid out Young and beautiful, draped in shades of blue. And I thought I could lock all those doors you hid behind. The walls came down, baby, let me in. Drinking in the beauty of what's left behind to stay. Lost but not forgotten songs within our heart forever stay. You and I float upon our 
Well, that's pretty interesting. Uh, I know that as one of the team leaders of this project, a big part of your job was to get the entertainment, and clearly you went within the school to get one of your teachers, but how does they get entertainment for these acts? Well, basically the school itself has a Rolodex full of everybody that wants to do this, and uh, one of the, the teachers that's the liaison for the school uh, was a former drummer with Molly Hatchet, Dale Rock, and he became one of my good friends, and I ended up dropping keyboard tracks in his, <laughs> for his band, but he basically allowed me to use, get into the Rolodex so I could, when we had all the other labs, we could bring them in and I could, you know, have a, you know, contact the band beforehand and get a stage plot and all that. So that led us to having all the different acts that we had during the course of the year. And uh, originally we were going to go with the band, with Dale's band, and I was going to play with them, but we didn't get our date till too late. So it was thumb through the Rolodex time and find the, the right uh, bands. And, Logan was nice enough to do it for us. You know, he's a, he was a great instructor. And uh, Linda Nunez, the other act we had, had played with us before, felt that the key thing with her was that not only was she fairly dynamic, she was available. Yeah. <laughs> so that, that pretty much surmised what we were doing there. Yeah, I ended up actually doing one of those shows because I happened to come down and we needed a slot. And there you go. So uh, Availability is a big thing. Tony, I'd like to thank you for coming down, talking to us about the Full Sail experience. And My pleasure. Uh, a little bit about music in the San Jose area, and we're going to go out with Linda Nunes. Thanks, bro. You got it. <laughs> 